you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you this morning. Father, we thank you for your word that doesn't return void. And Father God, we thank you that our hearts and our minds are, are ready and open to receive your word, Father. And we thank you that it will be sown on good ground, Lord. And Father, we thank you for revealing just more of yourself to us this morning. We give you glory and we give you honor in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone says, amen and amen. Okay. You know, how many of us realize that our world is changing? You guys see that going on? You know, regardless of how old you are, in the time that you've been on planet Earth, right, as you've gone through some things, you've seen some changes going on. I can say in my 45 years, what I've seen, of course, I've seen a lot of changes. You know, right now, you see a lot of changes with technology. You know, we grew up in a generation where there was no cell phones. You know, if you had to make a phone call and you were away from home, you had to go to, in somebody's house and ask to use the phone inside their home. Or if you had a dime, you could make a phone call in a pay booth. Remember that? You know, but it was also a good way also of, uh, you know, getting away with going home late. You didn't get calls and texts from your parents telling you, hey, where are you? When you coming home, right? You just got it when you got home, right? But our world is changing. And I was reading a story just recently this week about a 90-year-old man in Florida. I don't remember exactly where in Florida. 90-year-old man. And he's part of a small organization, nonprofit organization, that's called Love Thy Neighbor. And I like that name, Love Thy Neighbor. That's a biblical concept there, right? And what they do every year is, and, and I believe it's an all-year-long thing that they do, their thing is like a, it's a feeding the homeless ministry is what they do. And that's big on their heart, and that's what they do. And, and in this thing, article I was reading, the, the 90-year-old man was saying, and we don't give them the same thing every day. We, we give them different, you know, types of food to eat because we know that people enjoy eating different things, right? And so he's talking about how he's doing this, and, and he goes on to say why he's doing it. I guess it was a passion with his wife who's now gone to be with the Lord, and he's carrying it on because that was something she liked doing. But this is the thing that I wanted to share with you about uh, how our world is changing. This man has been in the news lately, if you've been watching the news, um, He's been given citations by the local police for feeding the homeless. And I, th I think he's on number four now. He got up to, he's got his fourth citation from the police. <laughs> and he quoted, it was funny, he was saying that he remembers one day he was out there feeding the homeless and he felt somebody grab his arm. And he looked and it was a police officer. And the police officer said, put that down. He was holding some food. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't have a, you know, a weapon on him. He, was, he, didn't, you know, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just feeding the homeless. Mind you, he's 90 years old, okay? And so he's gotten four citations now. And what's happening is in this particular city, they're trying to combat the growing uh, issue of homelessness because they're saying citizens have been complaining. It's a beach community, and I guess they kind of overtaken the park. And citizens have been complaining. They're saying that, you know, all the homeless are there and, you know, they can't go and use the park because they're all camped out there or, you know, they're, they're being, you know, a, a nuisance to them. And so the city has basically tried to take some measures to kind of combat homelessness, but they're going all about it wrong because they're saying that by feeding the homeless, you're encouraging them and they're trying to keep them or push them away. But my point is this. Our world is changing that you can get in trouble for doing something good for somebody else, right? Think about it. Trying to give food to somebody. What's wrong with that? I, I think that's something that we should all be doing around the world is feeding our brothers and sisters, right? And, and the point I'm sharing with you is that our, our world is changing, but I want to share some good news with you this morning that our God never changes. Amen? 
You know, the Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. He does not change, right? People change, things change, but our God never changes. And that's good news for you and I, that he does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. That is good news for you and I. Because it doesn't matter what's going on out there, our God is consistent. He's always the same. Amen? Let's go to the Gospel of John chapter 8. The Gospel of John chapter 8. And we're going to take a look here at verse number 12. Verse 12, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. See that? He is the light of the world. And he's saying right here in verse 12, he who follows me shall not walk in in darkness, but have the light of life. That's good news. When he's saying right there, he who, who does not walk in darkness, talking about walking in sin, basically. You know, and he's saying, hey, follow me. Follow me, and you won't be, you know, walking in sin. Because why? Because sin is the opposite of what he is, right? He is the light. He's love. He's good. And so the thing is this, is if we're following after him, we don't got time for that type of stuff. I hope you guys can see the connection in that, that we don't have time for that nonsense when we're truly following him. See that? He says, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Go to Matthew chapter Five, and let's take a look at what Matthew 5.14 says. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. This is Jesus talking right here. And then if you don't know this, just a little, little nugget I'll give you. In Matthew chapter 5, this is where we get... The Beatitudes. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes is a very popular scripture in the Bible, the first part of Matthew 5. That's not what we're going to be looking at, but it's in Matthew chapter 5 nonetheless, and very, very interesting, uh, the Beatitudes. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, look at what Jesus says. He says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. So did you get that? You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Look at verse 15. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. But look at verse 16 right here. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You see that? When you're out there doing good for others, like this man is doing over there in Florida, this 90 year old man feeding the homeless. Now he's 90 years old. He could have already called it quits. He could have said, you know what? I've done a lot of things in my life. I've helped a lot of people. I just want to sit in my rocking chair, watch the prices right, read the newspaper, take a nap, right? And that's it. No, he's out there doing things. 90 years old, and he's still out there 
being a blessing to others. Now, I'm sure he probably doesn't move as fast as he used to, right? I'm sure maybe he may not even be driving. I don't know. Maybe he has to have somebody drive him over there to feed them. I don't know. But see, those obstacles are not obstacles for him. Because see, he is saying, hey, Lord, you can use me. I'm an old man, but I'm willing to do this for you. And he's doing it. And what's happening is now, basically, the whole country has been watching what's going on over there. I didn't share with you the rest of the article, but because of these four citations, a judge has intervened in this situation, and basically, the law or the ordinance that the city has passed that you can't feed the homeless or else you're going to have to pay a fine, the judge has suspended the ordinance temporarily until they can work something out. Because even the judge, and I don't know if the judge is a Christian or not, but even the judge is saying, hey, from, from a, a legal perspective, this guy's trying to do good. How can doing good be wrong? And so there's been intervention taking place. Because remember, our God does not change. We may change, things change, but our God does not change. And so here he is out there doing this, and he doesn't care, he said, if he gets arrested or he gets more tickets. He says he will never stop feeding the homeless because that's what he's been called to do. Regardless of what the circumstances or the consequences may be for him for feeding the homeless, it does not matter. He's going to continue doing that. Isn't that awesome? You got a man who's made up his mind. He has a purpose in life, and he's saying, I'm going to follow through with this at all cost. I'm not going to let my age get in the way. I'm not going to let the legal system get in my way. Nothing's going to stop me from doing this. And right here, he's doing exactly what we just read in Matthew, or excuse me, yes, Matthew chapter 5. Verse 16, that, you may, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, when we do good things, God gets the glory, unless we don't give it to him, unless we take the, the credit, right? So, I'm sharing this with you because we've been talking about for the Christian, this is something that we should be doing daily and all year long. Not just during Christmas time, but all year long. So what this does for us, it's, it, it's a good refresher to help us remember that this is something that we need to continue on as we go into the new year 2015, that we need to continue you know, with this spirit of giving. Regardless that it's not December and we get into January and we get in those other months, we need to continue with this mindset and with these acts of kindness and these acts of love because this is the essence of our God. Think about it. That's what he's about. Loving on people. And so many people out there don't know or even realize how much God loves them. Because if they did, many of them would not be doing what they're doing. Sure, you're always going to have that small percentage of people that don't want anything to do with God, and there's nothing you're going to say or nothing that can be done that can convince them. And that's okay. But there's those ones that need to be reached. And how are they going to be reached? if we don't go reach them. Think about it. God has commissioned the church, right? The church has been commissioned. You are the church. God has commissioned you to go and continue what he started with his works, taking his message of love to the world. And, and we've talked about how you don't have to go to Africa like Peter and Donna, but you can have a 
how do you say you, you can have a part of what they're doing in Africa by what? Praying for them. They need lots of prayer. You talk to them. I know many of you here receive their monthly newsletters or get uh, emails from them. And you hear what they're saying. Hey, pray for us. So you could pray for them and you can also sow into what they're doing financially. You know, giving them a, a, you know, a monetary gift because, you know, they're living on faith. Living on faith. Both walked away from their jobs and say, God, we're going to just do what you called us to do, and we're going to believe you to bring in the resources. That is awesome. Not very many people will do that. But they're doing it. And so the thing is this, is that we are to continue what Jesus started in showing people how much he loves them. But see, what happens is when we get caught up in our own messes, how can we love on others when, when we don't even love ourselves or, or we don't even, you know, uh, like ourselves and you're stuck in a mess, you're stuck in a rut with your own situation, your own things going on, how can you be any good to anybody else, right? And that's what the enemy wants. Distractions, roadblocks, he's constantly trying to keep you away from the things of God. Whatever it is or through whoever it is, he's trying to keep you away from the things of God. Distractions is what's happening. And so as we allow those distractions to happen in our life, they will keep us away from the things of God. See, you may ask yourself sometimes, you can look to your neighbor on the left and look to your neighbor on the right and say, why do they seem closer to God? Or why does it seem that things are going good for them? Or, you know, you may continue to question God about, you know, others. And the thing is this, is that you have to have, you have, to have a mindset like this gentleman we're talking about who says, you know what, I'm going to continue to do this no matter what's going to happen. In other words, your relationship with God and getting closer to Him. You know, yesterday at the men's breakfast, I, I shared something from Psalm 15, and I want to take you there. Let's go to the book of Psalm chapter 15. And I was showing the men yesterday at the men's breakfast something about, about David. And why do we talk about David so much? Well, you know, you may ask yourself, you know, what's the big deal about David? Why do we got to always talk about him? Well, did you know he's known as the man after God's own heart? That's why we talk about David a lot. Here's a person who is wanting to get closer to God, right? So here in Psalm 15, look at verse 1 says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? In other words, David's asking the question about who may, you know, get close to God, right? Now, he uses the, the, the word tabernacle. He uses the word holy hill. There's also a, another term that's used, and they all basically mean the same thing, right? You ever heard throne, right? The throne of God, right? Same thing, tabernacle, holy hill, throne. They're all synonymous. They all mean... The, the, the same thing, you know, basically the presence of God, right? And David's asking the question, you know, who may, you know, be there in the tabernacle? Abide. That word abide, though, means temporary. But when he says, who may dwell in your holy hill, dwell, that word has a, a, a meaning or a definition of more of permanent residence. Permanent residence there. In other words, David is asking the question here, you know, who can know you more, Lord? Or in other words, he's saying, how can I, how can I know you in a, in a deeper way? Right? Because see, that's David's desire. His heart's desire was to know God better than he knew him and to fellowship with him in a deeper way. And that's why David's asking the question, who may 
do this. Right? Who may do this? Look at verse 2. David gives us an insight on some of the characteristics that uh, we have to uh, be displaying. Verse 2. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. Or in other words, let me say those three things like this. There's blameless character, righteous conduct, and truthful conversation. It's three characteristics that David is giving about some things that, that we have to do. If you want to go deeper in the things of God, there are some things that have to change in your character. See, because if you stay the same, you stay where you're at, you're, you're, you're stuck in park, like a car, you know, and you have it in, in park, right? You're not going nowhere, you know? And, and what happens is what? Is that basically you stay in the same place. It's not good to stay in the same place. It's good to constantly be growing. You know, doctors have found out that as people age, that if they don't use and exercise their brain uh, as much as they used to when they were younger, that what happens is it, it has a negative effect on them, right? So think about it. You have somebody who's constantly using their brain. They're constantly thinking and problem solving, whatever it is, line of work that they do, right? So their brain is being used regularly. Well, then all of a sudden, that person gets to an age and they get to retire. They don't got to work no more. So guess what? Now they don't have to problem solve and do the kind of thinking they were doing anymore. And so the brain activity slows down. Now, it doesn't have to be that way, but it's, it's a choice for the person. And doctors have found that if a person, you know, uses their brain, continues to use it, that it'll be sharp. They don't got to start losing their memory. How many times have you talked to a person who's getting older and they'll say, oh, my, my memory's not what it used to be. It's, it's you know, it's, it's slowing down or I'm, I'm more forget, forgetful these days or, you know, I, um, you know my, my mind's not the same. It doesn't have to be like that. It don't have to be like that. Doctors have found that if you continue to use your brain, in, in your older years, even if you're retired, you can still function and be sharp in your mind. Well, how do you do that? Don't ask me. I'm not a doctor. I'll give you a few ideas. Think about it. Why do, why do some people are always doing crossword puzzles? Yeah, they're may, they may be fun, but they're using their brain. Some people will go and take classes, right? They'll do reading. They'll do things to what? To get that brain stimulated, right? Because if all you're going to do all day is watch the prices right in retirement, it takes no thinking whatsoever. And you may disagree and say, no, that's not true. I have to guess the price of the item, right? But think about it. Did you know a rock can watch TV? My pastor once said that. A rock can watch TV. All you got to do is get a rock and set it in front of the TV set. A rock can sit there in front of the TV. In other words, it takes no effort whatsoever to watch television. Now, don't get me wrong. I like watching TV just like the next person. But the thing is this, is that we can't stay in front of the, the what do they call it, the boob tube. We can't stay in front of it all day long because it's, it's just not going it, to, unless that's your plan to do nothing because you're not going to accomplish anything. And the thing is with your brain activity, it's not really doing much good for you unless you're watching, I don't know, a show where they're doing mathematics or something and you're having to figure out a problem. I don't know. It's possible, definitely. But what I'm saying is this, is that you don't have to go with the flow. It doesn't have to be the norm. The bottom line is this, is that continue to set goals for yourself. Continue to push yourself until you cross the finish line. So many of us, we think that we've arrived and we're done. That's it. I don't got to do anything more. 
But, you know, what does the Lord tell us? He sends a message to us all the time and tells us, I got work for you. How many times in the Bible do you see these great men and women of God that did great things for God that uh, it talks about that they retired and moved to Florida? How many times do we see those things in the Bible? They retired and they, you know, they moved to paradise where the weather was warm. They went to Palm Springs, right? We don't see that in the Bible. What we see is when a man or a woman of God die, uh, 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 is done doing their job for God, they're passing on the mantle. In other words, they're passing the torch to the next generation to go ahead and continue the work of God, and then they die. They cross the finish line. Right? That's what we see in the Bible. But see, so many times we get caught up in, you know, in what's going on in the world and, and, and the things of, you know, the world. And like I said, don't get me wrong, retirement's good, and there's nothing wrong with doing things for yourself. Nothing wrong with that. But it's about balance is what it is. We've got to continue to have that balance. And going back to what we were seeing here with David, David is saying that he's not satisfied with his relationship with God, that he wants to know God even more. He wants to know God even in a more deeper way than he knows him. And you're talking about the man who's called the man after God's own heart. This is the David who sung songs to the Lord, who was a you know, a man after God's own heart saying, Lord, you know, I want to know you more. How can I get to know you more? And he says, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Right? So in other words, he's basically talking about he wants to go more into the presence of God. And I just shared that with you because, you know, we can learn so much from this these two scriptures here in Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. We can learn so much. What I, what I want to encourage you is, don't get caught up in the same old, same old. Don't get caught up be, staying in the same place day after day, right? Same old, same old. Don't get caught up in that. Because why? Because there's work to be done. And how is that work going to get done unless you do it, right? And what I want to encourage you is don't be afraid to do something for God. Start with the baby steps. There's things to be done here. Brother and Anthony and I were here after the men's breakfast doing some work yesterday. Now you're probably looking around saying, well, what would you do? It looks the same, right? It looks the same. Hey, things have to get done just because you don't see it, but there's things that have to get done. And I just can't get around to everything. Like I said, I'm one person. But if we work together, we can get it done. Amen? God is good. Let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to go to verse 24. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And look at what we, we learn here in Hebrews 10, 24. It says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Let us consider one another to stir up love and good works, in order to stir up love and good works, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Right? This is why we do church. Because why? Because what happens when we're with other believers? Right? We're stirring up love and good works. Right? Look at what it says here in verse 25. As we get together, we assemble ourselves. Right? We exhort one another. That means to encourage. We encourage one another. And it says, so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day? The return of Christ. 
the return of our Lord, that day. That's what we're waiting for, is for him to come back for us. And until then, we're being told, hey, let's get together. Let's encourage one another. Because why? Because he's coming back. We can't, this is not the time to, uh, you know, I've mentioned it before, take your pack off. That's a term we use in the military. It's still work to be done. This is not time to go and, you know, say, okay, I'm done. Let's take a break. It's time to continue to get back at it. Amen? And, and the thing is this, is that Christmas time is a good opportunity to use to, use to, to get back into the, into the groove. Amen? To get back at it because people's hearts are open right now to us. Right? People's hearts are open to receiving. And it's a good opportunity for the believers to love on people. Because why? Because they're more open right now. But even so, the bottom line is this. We've seen that you are the light. You're the light. So you've got to go and let that light shine. How are you going to let your light shine if, you, if you're always staying where you're at? You've got to get out there. Right? Uh, Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. And I showed you in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. Right? You are the light. Let's go to Romans 13, 11. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Look at what the word says here in Romans. And do this knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. You see that? So in other words, hey, it's time to wake up. Right? It's time to realize that our salvation is near. In other words, our salvation is near. In other words, just like I mentioned in that last scripture with Christ being getting closer to coming back for us. You know, now is not the time for us to uh, put things off, right? I want to encourage you this morning to see the message the Lord is trying to give you. He's telling you that you're the light. He's equipped you. He's blessed you with gifts, God-given talents that he wants to use you he wants to use you to be that light to go show people how much he loves them that's what he wants to do and the thing is this is that nobody can force you to do anything that you don't want to do not even God would do that because he gave you free will God's a gentleman he will not force you only you can make that decision and say, you know what? All right, God, you can use me. Only you can do that. And so that's why I'm encouraging you this morning, don't stay where you're at. Go and do something for God. Pray about this. Amen? Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Right now, remember, I was telling you to go do something, but I'm not telling you to go beat people over the heads and tell them, repent, you're going to hell. Right? There's more that you can do besides doing that. You can love people into the kingdom. We don't got to condemn them into the kingdom. Amen? So verse 5 of Philippians chapter 4 says, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at 
hand. Anywhere in that scripture do you hear, hit them over the head with the Bible, make them feel guilty so they can get closer to God or they can get to church. It says, let your gentleness be known to all men that the Lord is at hand. In other words, we got to do it in a loving way, amen? That's what he's telling us to do in a loving way. People who go out there and want to condemn people and point fingers and all that kind of stuff, yes, we know what the scriptures say about some of those hotly debated, uh, debated topics, but that does not mean that we have to, you know, use those kind of tactics to get people's attention. Love. Love is what's going to get them to the kingdom. Amen? Love. God is love. And so I want to encourage you, let your light shine. Just as we looked at earlier in, in John and in Matthew, you are the light. Let your light shine. People need love this Christmas time. And, and you know, more so than a, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, a new set of, uh, what is those, uh, what do you use when you take the things out of the oven, those uh, pot holders, right? Those are a very popular item to give away. Everyone can use pot holders, right? People need your love. That's what they need. So go out there and give it. Let your light shine, amen? Amen? And watch what happens. Watch if you don't see God do some dynamic and miraculous things. Don't be surprised if you witness miracles. This is when these kind of things happen. Right? Because why? Because God is able to move in these situations. Amen? We, we open up the door for him to come in. He's invited when we operate the way he tells us we should operate. You'll see great things happen. And I just want to encourage you to be mindful of that. Go out there and share the love. Just like I was mentioning with this man in Florida, this 90-year-old man out there feeding the homeless, getting ticket after ticket, and being threatened with being put in jail because that's what they were threatening to do to him, to throw him in jail for feeding the homeless. And I just love his attitude. Which was what? His attitude was, I don't care what they do, they're not going to stop me from feeding the homeless. His mind was made up that he was going to go and do this, and nothing was going to stop him. And we looked at, he was 90 years old. Even his old age did not stop him from doing this. Oftentimes, you and I can use all the excuses in the world of why God you know, we can't do something for God. Well, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not as, as holy as I should be. You know, uh, you know maybe I, I don't have the education. I don't know how to speak to people. You know, we can give all these examples. Some of us may even say, well, I don't have the time, right? I don't, I don't have the time to, to do something for God. You know, I'm going to toot my own little horn here for a minute. I don't do that very often. But um, Pastor Trish and I work full-time jobs outside of the church, right? And in my line of work, I'm on call. So I don't just work 40 hours a, a day. Sometimes I'm working 12, 14 hours a day. And I still find time to pray, read my Bible, even come teach Bible study, even show up on a Monday and do a a marriage counseling class for a couple that's getting married here in a few months. You know, be here at the men's breakfast on Saturday. And then I even have to find time to change the light bulbs in my own house. Sometimes I don't get to them right away. Usually the projects at my own home get on the back burner because everything else is on the what? Is on the front end. Now I'm not saying this to toot my horn, but what I'm saying is this. You can do something for God. And I'm not going to buy it if you say I'm too busy because I'll tell you what, 
Let's sit down and compare schedules. Let's compare phone calls and text and emails that I got to respond to. I'm just saying, if you make up your mind, you can accomplish so much. Just like that 90-year-old man who decided he was going to feed the homeless, regardless of what the consequences were, he made up his mind. This morning, I want to encourage you, make up your mind to do something for God. Don't be content with being a spectator. You know, we've talked about it so much here in this church that there's going to be crowns given out for doing things for God. We've talked about the five different crowns. If you go on our YouTube channel, you'll see that, that message recorded on there, the five crowns. But there's going to be crowns given out, one particularly for the soul winner, the one who's reaching people for the Lord. There's a specific crown for that, a reward, amen? And what you need to understand is that, you know, there's blessings in doing things for the Lord, so many blessings. And that's why I want to encourage you this morning to don't be satisfied with being a spectator. Get in the game. Get in the game. Get off the bench. God wants to use you. That's why he created you with so much talent and ability. Use it. Use it for God. Let him get the glory. Amen? I just want to encourage you this morning. Go love on others. Be creative. Do something. Acts of kindness. Show your love to people. Amen? If I can ask everyone to stand as we close in prayer. God is good. If I can ask everyone to just bow their heads and, and close their eyes as we, as we pray. Oh, Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, And Father, I ask you, Father, to just continue to show your people how much you love them, Lord. Father, I also ask that you would continue to show them of how much work still needs to be done. And how every single person can be used. Every single person in this building is qualified to do something for God. Every single person in here. Oh, Father, I pray that you show them that they are able. And that they are equipped. All they have to do is be willing all they have to do is be willing. Father God, I just I pray this morning, Lord, that you would show them. Make it easy for them to see, Lord. Show them that you have an assignment for them. That you're waiting for them to, to fulfill that assignment. Oh, Father God, I thank you this morning, Lord. I thank you for your word. And Father, we thank you for those men and women who have gone before us whose shoulders that we stand on, those generals in the kingdom who have devoted their life to furthering your kingdom, Father. And yet all you're asking us is just to do something. Father, we thank you this morning. And Father, help us to be mindful this Christmas season of sharing your love with others. Because that gives you glory. That gives you honor. Father, we thank you this morning, Father, as we close. We lift you up. We thank you, Father, that you don't change. We know our world's changing, but you're still the same. And we thank you for that, Father. We thank you, Father, that you're the same yesterday, today, forever. You don't change. Lord, we love you. Thank you for being on the throne. Father, we give you glory and honor. And all God's people said... Amen and amen. You guys can have a seat as we... Uh